Hello and welcome to this special session at the 70th annual conference of the International Communication Association, a virtual conference and a virtual panel. My name is Mark Deuze. I'm a professor of media studies at the University of Amsterdam, and I'll be your host for this panel, which features, among other stellar members, three presidents of our association, a past, the present, and the future president of ICA, all shining a light on what our field is and where it's going. What is the nature of mass media, mass communication theory and research? Um, a panel particularly relevant in our current time of infodemics and pandemics and, and the new interest in the role that media and media technologies play in, in all of this. Our panel is largely inspired by the publication of one of the, I guess, seminal handbooks in our field, the seventh edition of McQuail's Media and Mass Communication Theory, a book that I've been very privileged to be able to take part in as one of the authors and editors working with the late Dennis McQuill. Dennis, of course, wrote the first version of this book back in 1969. Uh, at that time, a sociology of mass communication, which book and subsequent versions and editions of this book in part contributed to the establishment of our field as an independent discipline amid all the other disciplines at the contemporary university. So a book with a large heritage and um, a, a, a grand narrative, if you will, of our field. But how relevant is that field still today? How useful are these concepts? What are the different ways we could think about this? And how all, does all of this inform our research, um, our studies, our studying, and of course, our everyday media lives as human beings, as citizens and consumers in this world? I would like to briefly introduce our panelists and their key arguments to you. Uh, then, of course, I'll hand it over um, and um, at the end, I'll uh, conclude our panel and invite you all, as I am doing right now, to participate in the online debate during the conference, after the conference, online, and hopefully at some point in the very near future, offline. Um, so our panelists are first and foremost Professor Terry Flew. But Terry, of course, is the current president of our association. He's also a professor of communication and creative industries at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane and Australia. And what Terry will do in his presentation is to challenge the notion of mass, not that it's not relevant anymore, but that it has changed from a reference to people to a reference to data aggregates. We are not individuals anymore. We are cut up and divided across multiple databases that are not just used to sell us things, but also to increasingly govern our lives in all kinds of algorithmic ways. Our second panelist um, is Professor Barbie Salazar. Barbie, a past president of ICA back in 2009, and currently, and for a while now, the Raymond Williams Professor of Communication at the Annenberg School of Communication in Philadelphia um, in the United States. And Bobby will give us an historical appreciation of the mass in mass media and mass communication and suggests that its ambiguity, its lack of clear definition makes the mass so important as a concept because it's a, it offers a shared space for people from all kinds of different backgrounds, social sciences, humanities, different disciplines, sociology, psychology, anthropology to meet and discuss the shared issues of concern when it comes to the role of public communication. Um, we then move on to an interview I had the privilege of being able to do with Professor Hermann Wasserman, Professor um, of uh, uh, Media Studies and the Director of uh, the Film and Media Studies Center at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And like I am, a former journalist, uh, a kindred spirit. Um, with Hermann, uh, we talk about who this mass is in mass media and mass communication and articulating the fact that most of our knowledge and the knowledge production about mass has traditionally come from the global north. 
But instead of arguing for more diversity and inclusion, which in and of itself are, of course, incredibly important issues, Hermann challenges us to move beyond these questions to use ethics as a truly global framework for addressing the important questions of our time. Who are we in media? What do we expect of ourselves and each other and our institutions in and through media? How do we expect to communicate effectively and ethically in this sort of new pandemic infodemic world that we're all living in? Um, our fourth panelist unfortunately couldn't participate, but I do want to mention her and her work because it, I consider it, uh, and we all consider it, incredibly important for our field. This is Professor Christina Arketti, who is a professor of political communication and journalism at the University of Oslo in Norway. And if she would be able to participate, I hope she'll forgive me if I, if I paraphrase that her comments would most likely focus on the all too easy assumptions embedded in most of our theoretical concepts and challenge us to adopt more creative and intimate ways of doing our research and presenting our research. Um, our panel will close with a response by the current president-elect of the ICA, Professor Clay Savreza, who's a professor and director of political communication at the Amsterdam School of Communication Research, also at the University of Amsterdam. Clayce and I go way back. We started our PhDs in, at ASCOR back in the day. And of course, we both had the privilege of being taught by Dennis McQuail in his final years as professor in Amsterdam. And Clayce will offer a response to the presentations and interviews in this panel, focusing particularly on the new geography of knowledge production when it comes to mass media, mass communication theory, and challenging us to think creatively and critically about the role of our field and of our work in the current discussions, global discussions, about this pandemic and infodemic that we're living in and through. So all together, uh, I invite you to sit back and relax and enjoy this hour of what I feel is incredibly stimulating and inspiring discussion. And I'll see you on the other side in the online debate. Hello, it's uh, great to be a part of this uh, panel organized by Professor Mark Doiser from the University of Amsterdam titled On the Grand Narrative of Mass Communication Theory and Research here at the ICA 70th Annual Virtual Conference. As we know, um, Mark undertook a very ambitious initiative uh, recently in uh, completing the much-loved Mass Communication Theory volume uh, produced over six, edition, six editions by the, um, the late and um, much-missed Dennis McQuayle. And uh, what I think is very interesting about uh, what Mark has done here is that uh, the chapter I was given to review referred to the rise, decline and return of mass media. So I think what Mark did with this collection, which I think is uh, very interesting to note, is that he sought to rehabilitate the notion of mass communication theory, as McQuayle had originally presented it, at a time when arguably it's become less, less fashionable. So I think that's a very important initiative that um, Mark undertook with this uh, edition. Now I note that uh, he refers to the question of the masses and he argues about the decline of mass media. And I think perhaps the most famous uh, reference to that is from Raymond Williams, 1958, Culture and Society, where he argued that there are in fact no masses, there are only ways of seeing people as masses. And so I think what is important in the return of mass media is that what Doiser is doing here is not necessarily rehabilitating the notion of mass communication as it was practiced in the 20th century, but rather suggesting that there are different ways in which uh, communities are now being seen as masses. And I think that that's a very fruitful observation. So looking at the uh, chapter, the return of mass media in the age of digital platforms derives from seven considerations. First of all, he looks at big data as a primary driver of the digital economy, and there's very extensive literature on that. He also talks about the Internet of Things 
as the rise of this non-human mass communication network. So the implicit humanism in William's original formulation is challenged by phenomena such as big data, algorithmic governance, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things, all of which point to machine-to-machine -machine communication. He also points, not surprisingly, to the changing political economy of digital capitalism and, of course, the enormous global market power of the digital platform giants. And there are various figures we could cite here. Uh, Google continu continuing to account for about 90% of search worldwide, uh, Facebook accounting for about 60% uh, of all social media activity, Google and Facebook between them accounting for about 70% of digital advertising. We also have the concerns about the masses as other associated with phenomena such as fake news, filter bubbles and echo chambers. Now, I think importantly, even if we reject concepts like filter bubbles and echo chambers and indeed fake news, they nonetheless rely upon the proposition that people can continue to be manipulated in some or other form by the mass media, which indeed was an animating concern of mass communication theory. Uh, Doiser also notes that digital platforms became tools for collective action networks, or what uh, William Bennett has referred to as connective action, and uh, Castells has made similar observations. Uh, he also points to the renewed focus among policymakers, particularly from about the mid 2010s, on questions of governing the internet. And among the issues considered here are digital literacy, privacy, online harm, copyright, extremist content uh, associated initially with uh, terrorism concerns, and most recently in the age of COVID-19, that of uh, conspiracy theories, which of course have a long history. And finally, uh, in this chapter, Doiser refers to renewed interest in the influence and impact of media in an age of what following um, Andreas Hepp uh, has been described as deep mediatization and the ways in which this articulates to a return of the media effects debate. So we see here in short that uh, we have traditional media barons still in place, but do the contemporary figures, the, um, the Jeff Bezos's, Mark Zuckerberg's, Elon Musk's of the world, the Tim Cook, start to themselves resemble the media barons of yore. There would be those who would certainly suggest that is the case. You're asked to provide an Easter egg in your presentation, so I've done so. Now, this is what's known uh, globally as the phenomenon of the tech clash, which uh, was a coined term by The Economist in 2017, uh, most clearly associated with uh, uh, figures such as the Democrat Senator Elizabeth Warren, who'd been calling for a breakup of big tech. And there's a number of inquiries internationally that have related to this, including in Australia, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission's Digital Platforms Inquiry. Now, when we think about uh, big digital platforms, we need to be wary, as Dwayne Winsick has observed, of uh, falling prey to the law of large numbers, that simply assuming that bigness equals power. If there's one thing we're seeing in the current environment, that the traditional media giants of yore, the news corporations and Disney's and Time Warner's of the world, no longer look as powerful as they're estimated to be as recently as a decade ago. And the whole phenomena associated with COVID-19 has accelerated this. So uh, basically, monopolies can be undermined. There can be creative destruction and uh, new giants can emerge. So there is an, a competitive process we need to be aware of. In some ways, the interesting feature of uh, the rise of the digital platform giants and what connects us to this return of mass media is this idea of a new behavioralism. Uh, Hal Varian, the Google chief economist, makes the point about the possibility of internet computer mediated transactions through the internet, providing us with a market of one. So let's be clear what we're talking about here. We're not talking about a mass audience necessarily. It could be an audience of one or a market of one, but it is filtered through behavioral technologies that can view um, these aggregations as, as masses or the concept of social aggregation, where in, in effect the data trace around digital platforms is less around what you say or like or post or etc., but around your propensity to comment, like, post, etc. So 
uh, predictive data analytics is central to this process. So we get disaggregated and then re-aggregated data that generates new mass based less around demographics than around notions of psychographics. And we are seeing behavioural techniques applied to large scale data sets. We could look, for instance, at the ways in which uh, digital advertising is completely transforming the advertising process beyond the traditional campaign models. This presents us with some challenges as researchers, I think, that uh, the social constructivist tradition has given us a framework where we start with structures, class, gender, race, identity and so forth, see those structures as informing beliefs, ideologies, shared mental models, worldviews, etc., leading to ways of acting in the world. Now, there's always been alternative sequences to this, so I think it could be argued that modern environmentalism has started from beliefs, so if one can change beliefs, that will change behaviours, and that in turn can, or at least could, change structures. One could start with changing behaviours, so behaviours, changing beliefs, and then changing structures, so whether it be uh, the philanthropic tradition or the left humanist tradition with its emphasis on agency and so on. You also have the possibility that behaviours may not necessarily be grounded in beliefs and this has been the bet that behavioural economists have taken that you can change behaviours without it being premised upon underlying structures of belief. So we observe that structural explanations often lack uh, what economists refer to as micro foundations. So what links a group behaviour back to the behaviour of individuals? How does it aggregate upwards from the individual to the group? And we find that actual behaviours continually confound expectations. So we think about the popularity of right wing populists among working class voters, for instance. But behavioural economics has pointed out to other phenomena such as the importance of mental shortcuts, or decision-making heuristics that are frequently at odds with assumptions about rational decision-making. Daniel Kahneman referred to this as thinking fast and slow. Finally, and challenging the rational choice model of uh, traditional neoclassical economics, our institutions can frame our beliefs. And behavioural economics has brought together economics and psychology with a very strong public policy remit and predictive focus. And we can see from this timeline how quickly behavioural economics has developed in the course of not, not much longer than a decade uh, to Nobel Prize winners such as Richard Thaler, Cass Sunstein, who was a chief advisor to Barack Obama, and so on. Now, there's next stage to this that would take some time to go into, but it's been referred to as neuroeconomics, which not only brings together economics and psychology, but brings those together with sciences of the brain or neuroscience, and that's uh, something we need to consider as well. The implications of this, I think we're at a very early stage of thinking through this, and I don't think many scholars have done so. Neuroeconomics has a natural alignment with the priorities of digital platforms. The digital platforms are very interested in how the brain functions in the course of making decisions. And uh, we will see transformations of advertising in terms of where mass media is going, uh, direct payment is becoming more critical and as compared to brand building. I think it requires us also to get beyond social constructivism. We need more sophisticated theories of the subject than we've been working through so far. I don't think it's enough to any longer say that the subject is determined or possibly overdetermined by structural factors. And we have finally this notion of a new masses in social quantification and data doubles. And I don't think our field has really addressed this in a lot of detail. One exception I would put is the uh, 2019 book by Nick Calder and Ulysses Meiser, The Costs of Connection. And I think they do address the social quantification question in some detail. And of course, what they're observing here is that uh, social actors can exist here, but they exist through data aggregates rather than through human activity. So they become a live reality but, as they note, the underlying human subject and their perspective on the world remains for much of the time irrelevant to this process of knowledge extraction. And this will present us with new challenges in thinking about the masses and mass communication, as uh, Doisa drawing upon McQuayle has called upon us to do.
Terms of reference take shape by accommodating and contesting terms that have come before, and that makes sense when we think about how knowledge formations need to adapt to the changing conditions under which they inevitably ensue. But what happens when a core term of reference for a discipline begins to get ghosted? What are the ramifications for a field of knowledge when its fundamental reference terms stop being used? These questions currently surround the term mass in our field. The trope uniting mass communication, mass behavior, mass media is central because it's how we learned to conceive of public communication uh, in its mediated state. And to be sure, its precise relevance has shifted over time. But I think it's fair to say that the field emerged as a study of mass communication. Herbert Bloomer defined mass in 1935 as having heterogeneous geographic and social origins, anonymity, low interaction, little exchange of experience, loose organization. Most of those traits still prevail some 85 years later. And as Mark points out in his book, so do the accompanying experiences of loneliness, loss of security, lack of togetherness, loss of control, impersonality, apathy, and anomie. And yet attempts to erase the term argue that it no longer reflects what is central to the field. Attempts at erasure are not new. One of the first to claim that the idea of the mass needed retiring was sociologist E.V. Walter, who in 1964 wrote in Social Research that the term was complex, ambiguous, more than a symptom of malaise, more than a product of ideology. Mass society, he argued, was the idea of progress upside down, a social vision to replace the lamented enlightenment myths of progress and reason, freedom and civilization, all in an attempt to make them more relevant to the coming postmodern age. No wonder then that journals like Critical Studies in Mass Communication not long ago became Critical Studies in Media Communication, or associations like the IMCR changed the mass in its title to media. The impulse in each case has been to more fully embrace conditions that don't abide by the original definition of mass. But it's important to note that the term mass has always had what linguists call multivalent signifiers. It's never meant only one thing. Even dictionaries alternatively point to large numbers of people or things, to the activity of assembling things or people into one place, or to a large body of matter without any shape. So maybe it's no surprise that we have ongoing definitional problems in the field. Just last year, Kevin Ellis surveyed textbooks on mass communication and found that they couldn't agree on or define what the term mass meant. These multiple meanings, this definitional ambiguity, I would argue, offer a good reason not to ditch the term mass from our discussions of ourselves, but to reinvest in its multivocality. Perhaps it has survived as long as it has because it lacks the precision that might dampen its relevance, because it echoes the porous nature of many of our field's keywords. Do we have a consensual definition for communication? Do we have one for media? I want to briefly consider this from a historical perspective, and I'll discuss it primarily from the vantage point of the West and the US. Three stages characterize our thinking about the term mass, and they've taken shape not just in communication, but across the disciplines. Earliest nods would include Montesquieu and Tocqueville, but it was late 19th and early 20th century sociologists, and here I'm thinking of Tard and Le Bon, who were influenced by the French Revolution and linked the term mass with the crowd and the mob, lending a pejorative quality to entities like mass behavior, mass society, or mass mind. Though Marx at the time was differently defining the mass as the source of proletariat power, his marginalization largely buried that view. So the initial invocation of the term signified chaos antithetical to those trying to understand society. A more positive use of the term emerged with World War II, when there was an enormous cross-disciplinary interest in all kinds of collective behavior. Psychologists and psychiatrists began to speak of mass psychology, mass attitudes, mass hysteria following Freud. Sociologists targeted mass behavior, 
with mass society became, becoming what Edward Schills called a specter haunting the field. Political scientists concerned themselves with mass perceptions, later upgraded to the more administrative friendly notion of public opinion, and with mass rule, which later, of course, gave way to totalitarianism via the work of Eric Fromm, Karl Mannheim, and Hannah Arendt. Importantly, as Evie Walter claimed in 1964, this is the point at which the mass grew from being part of society, as in the crowd or the proletariat, dependent on whether you believed in Le Bon or in Marx, to being all of society. So no surprise that in the 30s and 40s, the term mass gets appended to the media. When Bloomer distinguished between the public, crowd, and mass in his seminal discussion of the movie audience, this was in 1935, he argued that the mass differed from the others because people needed a medium for interaction. This, of course, paved the way for those thinking about how to more closely tie the two together. Elliot Friedson, for example, soon after redefined the media as the condition by which the mass was able to take shape. This move uh, nodded forcefully in the direction of the study of communication, where investment with the media was instrumental to the field's disciplinary emergence. As the prism of the mass fueled enterprises like mass consumption or mass production, marketing research, uh, polling or adver advertising, each came to be seen as having societal value. And remember that administrative research was huge at this time in the U.S., the term mass was valuable particularly for the field of communication because it helped position all the entities being studied by communication scholars, and this would include um, the news, propaganda, advertisements, uh, entertainment, public relations, among others, all as part of one shared environment. Functioning as a common descriptor, the term mass helped set in place a way of looking that enunciated the shared dimensions of dissimilar entities in ways that could resonate with the key concerns of the field. This second stage, when the mass is seen as some kind of reasoned extension of enlightenment ideas, helped set in place a core concept with which scholars in the field could identify. But it did so in intellectually cobbled ways. As research expanded, remember this is a fervent time of growth for the field, the term mass became smaller than it needed to be. And instead of accommodating different invocations of the term, we already understood it as both chaotic and instrumental, what ensued had the effect of freezing, harnessing, and simplifying understandings of what was being discussed. So it wasn't long before anything described as mass was readily seen as unidirectional, uniform, and distant. And even as the field moved toward more active notions of the public, invocations of the mass became even more ossified, bracketed as a useful contrast to the active publics being championed by theories like Katz and Lazarsfeld's two-step flow or Stuart Hall's encoding-decoding model. Even the very idea of interpersonal communication, as John Durham Peters noted, somehow was dropped altogether from the prism through which mass communication came to be understood. The point I'm trying to make is that the mass was, from its earliest uses, part of a cluster of terms by which social thinkers across disciplines were trying to achieve clarity and by which communication scholars were trying to achieve disciplinary unity. This means that as a concept, it was never clear. As Marx says, it was the conditions of the 30s and 40s that made it seem more precise than it could have actually been. And it's here that we come to the third stage of the use of the term mass. And here I want to um, bring in Jeff Jarvis, um, who in his 2016 piece, Death to the Mass, argued that we are returning to that initial meaning of the word mass as an unruly crowd or mob. Though from the 1940s onward, mass media, mass marketing, mass production turned what he called the ugly masses, the mobs, into the good mass, the marketplace, he writes that now again we are back to the masses as the political mob, the uninformed crowd, in other words, Trump's base. This is for the media to correct, he says. They need to change their notions of the public, 
no longer to be seen as a mass that receives a one-size-fits-all product, but as a collective with its own preferences, values, and responses. And because the public is no longer interested in or trustful of the media, the media need to be rebuilt around relevance and value, not volume. This view highlights a disciplinary picture, a piece of the picture that I think needs contemplating. It's no secret that one of the most lobbied grievances about the field of communication is that it sometimes follows technology too earnestly. Each new shiny thing gets enthusiastically absorbed while appending its own set of blinders to the circumstances that came before, or so the criticism goes. This is for communication scholars to be wary of. If the shiny new thing is the digital, then the challenge is better understanding how its affordances complicate settled or old theory and concepts, why and under which conditions that can lead unnecessarily to neutralization. The full-bodied turn to the digital, as reflected in Jarvis's thoughts, pushes the idea of the mass to the background, making it seem as if it were only one node, and a node past its prime on a historical trajectory of multiple evolutionary stages. Though this raises the obvious question as to whether evolution has ever only been about dislodging what came before, more importantly, it again reduces the mass to less than it needs to be. Volume is not its only, only uh, product, nor is the one-size-fits-all model of the public the only descriptor of its workings. If the mass is more than just one evolutionary point on a continuum, as I'm arguing, but is instead the originary term by which later terms of reference for public communication have been able to take on meaning, then pushing it from use puts more recent terms into question as well. That's because even though the mass is no longer the key structuring principle of our relationship with the media, its logic, as we see in Jarvis's statement, is still with us. Even though its definitions were problematic to begin with and certainly are more complicated now than they were before. Raymond Williams reminded us in 1961 that there are no masses, just ways of looking at people as masses. The idea of the mass helped communication find its footing among the disciplines. This makes it a critical part of our identity as a field, a conceptual tool used by generations of communication scholars because it crystallized issues that helped put the discipline in place. It thus still plays a relevant role for locating what is, what has been, and what continues to be a central characteristic of public communication and it offers a key term for the shared space that communication scholars inhabit. Looking behind, beyond this moment is why old terms of reference thus need to live on. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Deuze, University of Amsterdam. I'm here with Hermann Wasserman, who's a professor of media studies and director of the Center for Film and Media Studies at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Hello, Herman. Hi, Mark. I, uh, how, is, how are things going in this uh, surreal time? It is surreal indeed, but we are still well and uh, the sun is shining. So uh, nice autumn weather here in Cape Town. So, Do you feel that the situation and the circumstances in South Africa are in any way unique or particular when compared to um, the debate uh, globally or, or, or are, are we all facing more or less the same issues? Well, I think we are, of course, facing some of the same issues. Um, I mean, the uncertainty, the anxiety, um, the, 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 you know, being locked down in your house, some of that is the same. But it is interesting this how, the, how this coronavirus crisis also, I think, foregrounded some of the questions that we will be talking about in terms of media access, uh, how do we theorize media access, etc. Um, because I, the one of the sort of narratives around the coronavirus crisis that is that we're all in this together, right? And that, you know, no matter where you are, you're not safe from this virus. And of course, on one level, that's true. But on another level, it's not true at all. Um, we are facing the same crisis, but we are facing it in very different ways. So as I'm talking to you, I'm hoping that my internet connection stays stable. 
Uh, it might not um, because we don't have the same bandwidth and access to sort of, you know, um, uh, the internet and, and, and Wi-Fi. Um, I am still in a very privileged position, relatively speaking, to my compatriots in the country, many of whom, uh, you know, literally have to get food parcels uh, to survive because they are locked down and they don't have um, access to work and food, etc. So um, I think when it comes to teaching, we see the same sort of thing. Um, the, the move online for us has not been simple at all because many of our students don't have access to laptops to start with, to data. Some of them don't even have electricity, you know. So um, it has been a real challenge to think through these things. Um, and, you know, we're making all sorts of contingency plans. None of them really are ideal. But um, it does foreground, I think, the fact that um, we have to think seriously about the inequalities um, in terms of access to media and what this makes possible or not. Um, and again, I think if one uh, watches international uh, television or you, you consume news, the, the, the sort of stories that you see um, are still, I think, largely from the perspective of, you know, people in the, in the north. And then I think um, in, in the south where we are um, and other places like India and, and Latin America and Brazil, for instance, I mean, you hear um, really different types of stories. Um, and of course, this is not to say that the situation is not serious um, anywhere else, but it's just a very different picture, I think. So we could actually, to some extent, replace the discussion on the virus with the discussion on media and mass communication in, in, in this narrative, uh, if, I, if I listen to you correctly, in the sense that the debate globally about the role of media and mass communication among scholars and students in particular tends to be shaped and formed primarily through the experience and literatures of the global north. And it's something you've pointed out in, in several of your publications as well. Um, how would you argue, can we bring that literature and those traditions and experience more effectively into conversation without running the risk of just pointing out similarities and differences or, or, or erasing differences or uh, somehow reifying them. I mean, we tend to get stuck uh, quite a bit uh, in these kind of debates. Um, I think this is a really good question um, because I think in the, in the last number of years, there's been a keen realization uh, in organizations like the ICA, for instance, that, that we have to internationalize more. Uh, the, the topic of de-Westernization has been on the agenda, as we know, for many years. But um, the question is still, what are the terms and conditions upon which that internationalization, that diversification ha happens? Because there is a real danger that, you know, with well-meaning attempts to include a more diverse range of international perspectives, they are just subsumed under the umbrella of Northern theory. In other words, we see examples from the South being used in a way that really just are there to confirm theories and frameworks that were developed elsewhere instead of allowing the experiences from the South to disrupt the dominant theories, the dominant frameworks. And of course, when you say disruption, you're solidly in the terrain of power and power relations. And, um, and, and for me, that is the key question here. Um, internationalization and divers diversification cannot happen without addressing the question of inequalities in terms of uh, knowledge production um, and, and power. One of my favorite quotes is from the Indian philosopher um, Vandana Shiva. I was introduced to her work by Shakuntla Rao, with whom I've also worked on global media ethics. And she said, you know, um, often the West is used as theory and the East is used as evidence. Okay, so the North provides the theory, provides the frameworks. The South provides the case studies and the illustrations to confirm that. You know, and, and we said um, that, you know, the, the, the virus in a way provides an analogy or maybe a metaphor for that, you know, that, uh, that globally, you know, the responses, the theories, the vaccines are developed and, you know, the South is often just the sort of um, the place where that is applied. And, and, and I think what we, um, what we, or maybe a better analogy is that of mining, you know, it's also been used. So the, the, the South provides the commodities, the raw material it gets extracted uh, it is value is added somewhere else, and then you know it is sold and uh, presented somewhere else. So I think if we want to do internationalization and diversification right, we have to um, do this in a in a way that really addresses power head on. And and 
that means that we have to realize that theories do not fall from the sky. You know, they are developed in specific contexts, they have histories, they are embedded in power relations. And uh, if we don't do that, you know, um, they, they lose their explanatory value. I mean, if they're not rooted in the limited, and, or if they're rooted only in the limited sets of experience in the North, they lose their explanatory value for us in the South. Um, maybe one last uh, point is that um, it's not only a plea, this is not a plea for some sort of social justice or academic justice or uh, charity, you know, uh, to say, you know, please also remember us. It is actually a, a, an argument to say that you cannot do good science, you cannot do good theory if your purview is so limited and, and, and your, your framework or your set of assumptions is based on a very limited set of experiences. So it's, it's, it's an argument for better science rather than an argument for justice. Um, to that question, um, when I was doing the research for the new edition for McQuill's Media Mass Communication Theory and, and trying to extend Dennis's original attempt to diversify the range of voices, but still finding myself doing exactly what you said. It's like taking the established theoretical frameworks that have been built up in the, in the Western of, or Global North sort of literature, and then adding, sprinkling, if you will, voices from uh, colleagues in India or in, in China or in Taiwan or Japan or uh, Brazil or Argentina or whatever uh, in, in there felt frustrating. However, I did come across to a couple of theoretical traditions um, in, in uh, the tradition of uh, theorization of aura media in, in, in Africa and folk communication in Latin America that seemed to suggest to me that the history of media mass communication theory in the South, I mean, I'm over generalizing here, seems to be much more from the perspective of people, what they are doing to communicate, to extend stories beyond their own communities, um, to mass communicate, in other words. Whereas the literature that I know from the established frameworks here in the West or in the global North are much more institutional, what the press is doing, what broadcasting is doing, what mm -hmm. the state is doing. Um, would you say that is a fair sort of, uh, or, or at least an interesting way into diversifying and uh, our, our theoretical frameworks? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting um, distinction. Um, I think, you know, there's always the danger that one essentializes uh, yes. the South as well, and that you say they are exotic, they're different. And, and you know, uh, if we think about something like political communication, for instance, um, on the one hand, we have to think about political communication in, in, say, for instance, South Africa. We have a long tradition of uh, dancing in the streets, for instance, uh, you know, toy toying, they call it. I mean, that's been historically in the struggle against apartheid, it's been a key strategy or a key um, apparatus, really, to communicate politically. Um, things like the semiotics of dress, you know, the way that people put on t shirts, or we have a political party, the economic freedom fighters, they wear red overalls and, and, and hard hats to parliament to signify, you know, and, and maybe disingenuously so, but signify that they're a workers' party. Mm. So that is a, a, a sort of a, maybe taps onto a sort of tradition of physicality, of th theater, of um, what Stephen Ellis called radio trottoir, the sort of um, radio of the sidewalk, the gossip and humor and satire. We're seeing it again now with the whole um, notion of misinformation, how misinformation in Africa taps or maps onto those older histories of orality. But at the same time, um, we also have to recognize that without something like television, that semiotics now to a large extent goes is lost. So the, the EFF that, that, that does their toy toying, their dancing, that, that put it on the semiotics, they rely on the TV crew being there to broadcast it. Um, the, so orality, uh, yes, the, it happens, um, but it happens maybe now through SMS and, and cell phones. So these two things, they, they, there's a meshing. And, and I think that's where we have to, and that's why, as you say, people and, and the way that people use things, the way that people um, live uh, in, in sort of in real life, that real lived experience is important because um, that takes us away from these abstractions and maybe also sometimes from this romantic notion of, um, you know, some sort of exotic, um, almost primitive way of communication in the South. So, um, but I think um, 
it is important that you know, these sort of things about oral media, what it does is it, it signals to us that we have to widen our conceptual apparatus. So I think once you acknowledge that the way that communication itself has been defined, mm. uh, that d definition in itself is a product of a certain set of experiences. And, and um, once you open it up for different types of communication, say, oh, well, maybe, maybe we should see dancing or wearing red overalls in Parliament as a sort of political communication. It opens up for more possibilities. Um, in your abstract for, for our panel and in your earlier, especially recently published work, you suggest uh, communication ethics as a way to, to move forward for our discipline, to really have this more uh, broader narrative, if you will, a more inclusive narrative that, that cuts across the um, either essentializing differences between the global north and south or um, um, brushing over these differences. Um, can you maybe give an example of how you see ethics as a, as a useful or practical framework uh, to move us forward? Well, the, the area of ethics in itself, I think, has been a really productive area where a lot of these debates um, have been, um, uh, you know, we've been having a lot of the debates around global media ethics, for instance. If, so if we think about the media now as, as globalized, um, to whom do communicators, media workers, journalists, to whom do they owe their ethical obligations, for instance? Mm. Um, do they owe it to only their immediate audience or do they now have to think about obligations to a global audience, potentially? For instance, so these sort of questions um, have been quite urgent and quite immediate, I think, um, and, and has made it important for us to think through um, these questions through the lens of ethics. So that's on the one hand, that's been a, it's been a very productive area of global media ethics. Um, on the other, uh, the other dimension of that, I think why ethics is so interesting um, is because it deals with questions of value. Um, and, and, you know, once we think about things like value, morality, um, who are we, who are we to each other? How do we relate? I mean, that is also the stuff of communication, right? So um, how, do I, how do I communicate myself, my thoughts? How do I articulate myself? How do I relate to you? Um, how do I communicate? What are the boundaries between us? Um, and, and, and those are ethical questions. And, and so for me, um, I think ethics has been an interesting lens through which to address these broader questions. Um, and of course, then the, the field of communication ethics, like the rest of the field, um, has been dominated by the, the well the zombie of the four theories of the press that you know that still stalks in the background um, there's been interesting work done on universal principles etc but again there we've struggled with the two poles of on the one hand coming up with some sort of global theory that ends up to be another imperializing framework that you know asserts itself on the world from the top down or on the other hand, lapsing into some sort of cultural relativism where you say, well, look at that ethical framework there, over there in Africa, that's how they do things and this is how we do things, it becomes relativistic. Um, so we have to find somewhere where there's a dialogue and where there's some sort of reciprocity and, and then that's a very challenging question. Um, it, it's interesting, I mean, your, your comment reminds me of, of, a, of a discussion also often iterated by, by Dennis McQuill in, in his work on accountability and normative theory, uh, the notion that it's not enough to, to theorize the media and mass communication be, simply because, well, you know, modern societies cannot function without media and mass communication, but you have to theorize about what is, what, how does media mass communication contribute to a good society? rather than explaining society um, as it is. And, and, and how do we take responsibility for our media and for what we do in media? Um, and so, so that I'm, I'm, that's a, I'm really inspired by, by what you said. And maybe in, in conclusion, um, if we move the field forward and, and we use ethics as a framework, um, I wanna come back to something you said in the beginning, the, the role of power. Um, in your work, you make reference uh, to uh, the political economy of our field, right? which um, is, an, to me, and an sort of a call to be and stay aware of how power is distributed in our field as such, 
who gets to speak, who gets to participate, who gets to set an agenda. But perhaps I'm not appreciating the, 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 the width of, of, of your argument there. So maybe in conclusion, you can tell us a little bit about how you see the political economy of our field play a role in how we move forward. Well, I think it's, it's very simple. It's not that profound, really. I mean, the, the political economy for me is, is basically um, who has the means to produce knowledge and who has the means to consume it. Um, and, uh, you know, so, for instance, again, to come back to what we're doing here on, on Zoom today, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to find a good signal, a good place to sit where I can have the Zoom conversation with you. Um, I've been trying to upload my papers to ICA website. It literally takes me a day to, to upload it. And I have, I have good co connectivity, uh, relatively speaking. That's, that's, that's something to consider. So it, um, I am chairing a panel um, of scholars. One of them is in Namibia, one is in Chile, et cetera. They are asking me how can they upload their papers because they, only, they can do voice, but they can't do video. So, um, you know, that immediately introduces inequality um, in terms of who is going to consume this, or what authority will a voice note on, on the conference site have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the video. I mean, these are really simple questions, um, but they do have a, quite a profound impact on how people's legitimacy and the authority of voice, et cetera, is, is heard. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, when you people submit an, uh, an article to a journal and they are told, well, your lit review is not up to date. Um, where do people access articles in expensive proprietary journals? Um, and uh, digital journalism, the journal recently, um, I see one of the proposals is that they would give free access for a period of whatever, three months or so to an author who is told update your lit review. And I think that's a really useful idea. Um, and that's a recognition of that diversity doesn't mean just including more voices and making sure that you have a person from each continent in your table of contents, but it means that you make it literally possible for people to engage. Um, you know, and that means travel funding. It means invitations to share center stage at conferences, not only some sort of ghettoized room somewhere or, you know, so these are really bread and butter questions. Um, they're quite simple questions, but um, I think they are often lost from sight when we think about inclusion, diversity, uh, with de-westernization in very lofty and academic and theoretical terms, uh, whereas they're sort of really material questions that we have to solve first. So perhaps the virtualizing of the ICA conference makes these kind of inequalities more visible than perhaps meeting in Australia would have done otherwise because we would have all assumed that everybody got there on their own accord on a more or less equal basis. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, I don't know how to assess the two, um, you know, people still have to get money to buy a air ticket and stay in a hotel and, and you know, buy food at a ridiculous currency exchange. So, you know, it, it would be interesting, actually, and I think that's maybe a project for ICA, um, is to do a sort of census afterwards and say, you know, let's compare and see what, what is possible and, and what is not. Um, but these are these are really middle questions and and you know we are confronting them every day when we when we speak to our students and uh, our students have actually led the way in putting this on the agenda for us it was for uh, protests that we've seen the last few years where they've absolutely demanded and insisted on on this um, the political economy of knowledge production and I've learned a lot from that. Um, Herman in conclusion um... We're going to put a video online of our panel with uh, all the speakers. Uh, and of course, the whole point of the panel is to invite discussion and debate. Now, of course, this debate will be virtual. Um, could you end us with something that you particularly hope for that will happen in the comments underneath this video or in the chats or in any kind of other discussions that this video might uh, emanate? Well, I'd like to hear from people um, whether, you know, what, what I, I hope that, other, that from my colleagues from the South will be able to participate and leave comments and say they agree or disagree. Um, but I'd also really like to um, hear from colleagues in the North to say what, um, what are their expectations of some sort of exchange? Or what are the expectations of this 
be westernizing and and i'm aware that you know it might come across sometimes as a sort of a set of demands you know or sort of sort of a set of threats in a way and then that certainly hasn't it shouldn't come across that way but i'd like to know how they also experience these um demands of and uh, for, for for greater internationalization of the organization and i think ica has been really uh, it's been really clear that you know the organization has realized that this has to happen um but of course you know a lot of challenges in in actually giving um making that possible all right thanks so much for your time thank you thank you mark i appreciate it and see you in the chat okay cheers <laughs>
uh, because in addition to these perspectives, we also see from some of the first results around uh, from research around the world in response to COVID-19 that there's an enormous increase in the consumption of very regular television news, which is often nation bound and is really geared at mass audiences. Um, we also see an increase in a shared mass, yet diversified uh, and, and to some degree personalized, um, but mass consumption uh, of, uh, of entertainment, both through television, but also through platforms like Netflix. So in what ways uh, are the concepts and the theories that are discussed in this book and in this panel also, um, that have often emerged from the study of traditional mass media, how are they applicable for understanding the unfolding of the pandemic? Will it lead to a reappraisal maybe of the notion of mass? Um, will the unfolding of the pandemic also as we see time progress lead to different consumption patterns? And how do we bring communication questions often stemming from the study of mass to the fore uh, of understanding the pandemic and its consequences. These are just two aspects that I wanted to pick up on in this short response to what is a great panel and an even greater book. And I hope that there will be plenty of discussion and reflection on the book and on the panel in the virtual part of the conference. Thank you. concludes our panel. Please join us online for your questions, your concerns, your comments, your ideas and inspirations, and let's continue the conversations. Thanks for joining us here at the ICA virtual conference, both live, semi-live, and asynchronous later on for the end of time.